I'm super excited to introduce Jacqueline Woodson. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, once a month the bookstore staff gets an email about upcoming authors that are coming to the store. And I went back and checked the original email, um, and the opportunity for Jacqueline's event came up a couple of weeks back at 11.13 a.m. At 11.24 a.m., <laughs> I responded, Jacqueline Woodson, exclamation point. Um, just, uh, just a huge fan. Um, Jacqueline's a, a best-selling and award-winning author of more than two dozen books. Her best-selling memoir, Brown Girl Dreaming, won the 2014 National Book Award, the Coretta Scott King Award, a Newbery Honor Award, and the NAACP Image Award, and the Cybert Honor Award. Um, her new novel that just came out in paperback that we're here to discuss tonight, Another Brooklyn, follows a woman by the name of August who, uh, brought back to Brooklyn because of a death in the family, is given a chance to remember and reflect what life was like for her in 1970s Brooklyn. It is a beautiful and moving story that went, uh, went to earn wide acclaim. It was a finalist for the 2016 National Book Award. Uh, the Washington Post described it as a short but complex story that arises from simmering grief. It lulls across the pages like a mournful whisper. And if I could add my own plug, uh, when I found out I'd be hosting again, I did the only sensible thing and I read it again. <laughs> <laughs> so without further ado, please help me in welcoming Jacqueline Woodson to Politics and Press. I love this bookstore, so <laughs> I am very happy to be here. I'm always so happy to come back. I wish I lived in D.C. Um, so I could come here every day, and I would come here every day. And I probably wouldn't buy books every day, <laughs> um, but I would definitely get some socks. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't buy books partly because I don't know. Um, Years ago, you weren't allowed to make this public. It was always hush-hush, but now everything is all transparent. But I'm the chair of the National Book Awards Committee for Fiction, and, um, and I have about 400 books in my office. <laughs> <laughs> so as a result, when I walk into bookstores, I'm like, ah! <laughs> um, but, um, um, and some of them, you get twice. So that, that's really scary. It's like, oh, no. Um, but I, I, I love this store. I can't say that enough. I'm such a, a supporter of independent bookstores and amazing independent bookstores that not only we can, can support, but that also support the community. And I feel like Politics and Prose has never said no to me or to my publicist when they've asked to, um, for me to come read here. Um, and also in terms of the way they support the young people. I, I've read here many, many years ago and even recently where they brought, brought in classrooms from both independent schools and public schools. So it's um, work against any class barriers. It's work to bring access to literature to all people. Um, and it, it's, it's work to do the right thing. So I'm grateful to be here and I'm grateful for all the people that are part of this bookstore. Can everyone hear me? Okay, um, I am fighting something, so I won't be doing a whole lot of hugging tonight to spare you next week when you're mad at me when you're sick. So I, I'm here on a book tour for Another Brooklyn in paperback, as Michael said. I was here when the book came out in hardcover, and it was new. And, and it's interesting to be on a paperback tour now because people, some people have read the book, um, and other people will lie about it, but there are... <laughs> the people who have read the book and now have different questions to ask me than they did the, um, when they, I came and they had not yet read it. So I w one thing I wanted to talk about is the inspiration behind Another Brooklyn. And I see that there are copies of Each Kindness. I see The Other Side. I see Brown Girl Dreaming and Feathers and Locomotion. Um, I see my body of work in the room. And I and, uh, wanted to talk about Brown Girl Dreaming, which was the first book I wrote before I wrote another Brooklyn. But y'all could still ask me questions about any book. Um, and when I was writing Brown Girl Dreaming, I wanted to write a, I wanted to figure out how I became a writer. And that, and understand how I got to this point of writing all these stories and and winning all of these awards, and just questioning my life and my impact on the world. So I just started writing down all these memories. And uh, I remember when I was a kid, my mother would say, I'd say something, and she'd say, you don't remember that. <laughs> and, and I'd say, but how do I know it? And so I became the family, um, 
the person in the family with the memory. So whenever someone had a question about some part of our history, they'd be like, ask Jackie. I'm sure she remembers. And, and I had memories going back really, really young. And so I, when I started writing Brown Girl Dreaming, I just started putting those memories on the page and trying to make sense of them and, and trying to see how those memories led to me being here now. Um, and I had all these memories that I had written all of these small moments and I was a total, total mess because I didn't know what the book was becoming. And usually by the time I get about halfway into the book, I know what the book is going to be. I know what it's trying to say. I know how it's going to say it. I know what the characters want. I know how they're going to get it. But with Brown Girl Dreaming, I didn't know any of that. And so I was stressing. And I um, remember going to have breakfast with my friend Toshi Regan, who's from DC and who's a singer and one of my best friends in the world. And, and we sat down and I said, um, you know, I'm trying to write this story of my life and nothing happened in my life. <laughs> and, and, and so why would anyone even begin to care about my life? And she said, what are you talking about? When you were born, the South was on fire. And, and my family had moved from Columbus, Ohio to Greenville, South Carolina to Brooklyn, New York. And it complete, that breakfast with Tosh completely unlocked the narrative. So I'm just going to read two pieces from Brown Girl Dreaming. February 12, 1963. I am born on a Tuesday at University Hospital, Columbus, Ohio, USA, a country caught between black and white. I am born not long from the time or far from the place where my great-great-grandparents worked the deep, rich land, unfree, dawn till dusk, unpaid, drank cool water from scooped-out gourds, looked up and followed the sky's mirrored constellation to freedom. I am born as the South explodes, too many people, too many years, enslaved, then emancipated, but not free. The people who look like me keep fighting and marching and getting killed so that today, February 12th, 1963, and every day from this moment on, brown children like me can grow up free, can grow up learning and voting and walking and riding wherever we want. I am born in Ohio, but the stories of South Carolina already run like rivers through my veins. So this is called um, Bushwick, Bushwick history lesson. And one thing that happened when I was writing Brown Girl Dreaming, and I think I talked about this the last time I was here, in the middle of writing it, my mom died suddenly. And I had um, had this idea that I write down all of these memories, and then when I stopped remembering, usually what happens in fiction, you write what you write the truth, right? You write what you remember, you write and write and write, and then when you don't remember anymore, you just start lying. And that's where the <laughs> fiction comes in. And so that's how you can keep writing and write into the fictive um, story. And so, but I knew that this was going to be nonfiction. And I knew that when I got to the point of no longer remembering, I'd go ask my mom and I'd ask my uncles and my dad. Um, and my mom died, she was 68, and she had congestive heart failure. Um, and so suddenly that door was closed and all of that history was gone. Um, and you know, when a person leaves us, with us go their stories. So I um, realized I didn't have her to ask anymore. So I went to Ohio, I interviewed my dad, I interviewed my aunt who's a genealogist, I interviewed cousins, and I just talked to everyone to try to get to the story. And so it shifted and became a story more about remembering my mom and how she shaped who we became as children of the Great Migration. So when my mom died, she had been living in the house I grew up in, in Bushwick. And she left the house to me. And um, so I ended up going back and forth to Bushwick a lot. And at that time, the neighborhood was changing quickly. Um, and it was going from being this underserved neighborhood to this hipster neighborhood that was getting, quote unquote, discovered, we call Columbus. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, I was bearing witness to that. And I went back and I read this piece from 
Bushwick history lesson from Brown Girl Dreaming, and I knew what I was going to write next. Before German mothers wrapped scarves around their heads, kissed their own mothers goodbye, and headed across the world to Bushwick. Before the Italian fathers sailed across the ocean for the dream of America and found themselves in Bushwick. Before the Dominican daughters donned guinceanera dresses and walked proudly down Bushwick Avenue. Before young brown boys in cut-off shorts spun their first tops and played their first games of skelly on Bushwick streets. Before any of that, this place was called Bostwick. Settled by the Dutch and Franciscus the Negro, a former slave who bought his freedom. And all of New York was called New Amsterdam, run by a man named Peter Stuyvesant. There were slaves here. Those who could afford to own their freedom lived on the other side of the wall, and now that place is called Wall Street. When my teacher says, so write down what all of this means to you, our heads bend over our notebooks, the whole class silent, the whole class belonging somewhere to Bushwick. I didn't just appear one day. I didn't just wake up and know how to write my name. I keep writing, knowing now that I was a long time coming. So, um, go to today's event, I like that. That's me, becomes a fan. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, when I started writing Another Brooklyn, I knew watching the neighborhood of my childhood change that I wanted to write a biography of that neighborhood. I wanted to write about it before um, it became the neighborhood it is. And I think one thing that happens is people don't remember the people who walked the land before them. I think of the native people, I think of the Lenape who walked the streets of New York before um, we got there. And I think about the more, um, the closer uh, history of some place like Bushwick that was black and Latino um, when I got there and it was on the edge of white flight and the white folks were moving out to places like Long Island and Westchester um, and Queens and blacks were coming in through the Great Migration and, um, and, and um, Caribbean and Latin people were coming in through immigration. And so it was, re and the people who were moving into the neighborhood we're calling it things like, you know, a neighborhood that is gentrifying, which is an interesting word to use for the changing of a neighborhood. Um, so, but I wanted to put on the page that neighborhood and all of its life during the period that I knew it, what was, which was 1970 to around the mid 80s, uh, 1990 really. And I wanted, so I wanted to write a piece of nonfiction. I had been named Young People's Poet Laureate, so I was reading a lot of poetry, talking about poetry a lot. And I, and I had been a novelist for many years, so I wanted to just marry all of those things. I wanted to have, what is it called, a thruple? So it's not a couple, it's when three people are dating. So um, <laughs> it is something I, I, I heard someone talk about, and I was like, I don't know how y'all do that. I don't know if I want to know, but here's the word for it. So. Here is a, it's a novel, it's fiction, um, but there's uh, nonfiction in it. And then there's, um, there's the narrative arc and there's the poetic element and hence lots of white space and lots of reasons to pause and think about the story I'm telling. Um, and having gone through the period of grieving my mom's death, I also knew that I wanted to write about someone going through their own journey. And as I was thinking about that, I knew I wanted to talk about the way our country uh, doesn't always allow for grief. You know, there's this way in which some, we lose someone, someone moves to the next place, and we're supposed to bounce back in 10 days or a month or um, in our year. And it takes much longer than that to be a part of that transition. So, um, so as Michael said, August um, comes back home because of a death and is looking back on her life. And so I'm going to read from chapter 7 where we meet where August talks about her girls. And all you need to know if you haven't read it is that um, August's mom who has disappeared, August doesn't know where her mother is. Um, and August is a very unreliable narrator. Uh, so she, uh, her mother, one thing her mother said was to keep women 
to not have women friends, which was also something I was investigating. I have this village of people who are helping my partner and I raise our children and, and get through our every day. And I was, I, I was always surprised to hear someone, a woman say, oh, I don't have women friends. I don't trust women. It's like, but where are your girls? Like, how can you walk the world without your girls? And so I started investigating how one would get to that point of not having their girls. So her mother said, keep your, um, keep women at the end of your arm and at the end of your hand, longest fingernail and keep your fingernails long. And so at some point I'm going to reference that. And at one point in the book, the girls having been inspired by Pam Greer are carrying razor blades in their socks, <laughs> which I always wanted to do. <laughs> I was always afraid of cutting myself. <laughs> And, you know, I don't know how she had them in her hair. She had, oh, she can pull a razor blade from anywhere and look beautiful doing it. That year, every song was telling some part of our story. We crowded around the small radio in Sylvia's room and listened. When Gigi's mother wasn't home, we went there after school, waited while Gigi used the key that hung from around her neck to unlock the door. There was no couch in the small, in the one-room kitchenette, so we sat on the floor around her clothes and play record player, the volume turned down low. We leaned in to listen as Al Green begged us to lay our heads upon his pillow, and Tavares asked us to please remember what they told us to forget. And Minnie Ripperton and Sylvia hit notes so high and so long, it felt like the world was ending. The world was ending. We had been girls wobbling around the apartment in Gigi's mother's white go-go boots, and then, and then, and then. Little pieces of Brooklyn began to fall away, revealing us. We envied each other's hair, eyes, butts, noses. We traded clothes and shared sandwiches. Some days we laughed until soda sprayed from our noses and hiccups erupted from our, in our chest. When boys called our names, we said, don't even say my name. Don't even put it in your mouth. When they said, you ugly anyway, we said, we knew they were lying. When they hollered conceited, we said, no, convinced. We watched them dip walk away, too young to know how to respond. The four of us together wasn't something they understood. They understood girls alone, folding their arms across their breast, praying for invisibility. At 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, we knew we were being watched. So we warned each other about the shoe repair on Gates Avenue, how the old man who reminded us of Geppetto made you sit on the hard wooden seat in the little booth so he could steal glances at your legs and bare feet. Take someone with you, we said. Don't wear dresses when you go there. When we weren't practicing walking in Gigi's mother's shoes, we were little girls in Mary Jane's and lace-up sneakers. When the heels wore down or the soles flapped away from the tops, we were given a quarter and sent to Gates Avenue. Just a little, the man said, please. We promised Sylvia she'd be more famous than anyone ever was. We told, her, I'm sorry, this is Gigi, I'm skipping around because of the audience. Um, we promised her she'd be more famous than anyone was. We told her no other brown girl had her strange eyes or crazily long hair. We believed ourselves when we said, that's what Hollywood wants, and I can't wait to see you on television, and you'll be more famous than Diane Carroll. Don't trust the altar boys, Sylvia warned her, if you're the only altar girl. When she opened her mouth to sing Nina Simone's Just Like Tom Thumb's Blues, our throats throbbed, our teeth locked together. Sylvia lived deep inside of those notes, halfway hidden from all of us. They've got some hungry women there, and man, they'll make a mess out of you. You have to be a singer, we said. You have to. After law, Sylvia said. We tried to hold on. We played double dutch and jacks. We chased the ice cream truck down the block, waving our change-filled fist. We frog jumped over tree stumps, pulled each other into gushing fire hydrants, learned to dance the loose booty to sly in the family stone, hustled to Van McCoy. We bought t-shirts with our names and zodiac signs and iron-on letters. But still, as we sit, slipped deeper into 12, our breasts and butts grew, our legs got long. Something about the curve of our lips and the sway of our heads suggested more to strangers than we understood. 
and then we were heading toward 13, walking our neighborhood as if we owned it. Don't even look at us, we said to the other boys, our palms up in front of our faces. Look away, look away, look away. We pretended to believe we could unlock arms and walk the streets alone, but we knew we were lying. We had long lost our razor blades, and none of us had ever truly stopped chewing on our nails. But still, I and I and I and I, we chanted, we and we and we and we. We hand-songed, down, down, baby, down by the roller coaster, sweet, sweet, baby, I'ma never let you go. Because we wanted to believe we were years and years away from sweet, sweet babies. We wanted to believe we would always be connected this way. Sylvia, Gigi, and Angela had moved far past my longest fingernail, all the way up my arm. Years had passed since I'd heard my mother's voice. When she showed up again, I'd introduced her, her to my friends. I'd say, you were wrong, Mama. Look at us hugging. Look at us laughing. Look at how we begin and end each other. I'd say, can you see this, Mama? Can you? Thank you. Thank you. So one of the most interesting things about writing another book, and I mean, it, a book is a journey. And um, one thing you find out, as I know the writers in the room know this, is when you enter the book and when you exit the book at the end of it, you're a different person um, because of how much you've learned about yourself and about whatever you're writing about. And so one of the things I got really interested in, in um, researching was how other cultures dealt with death. And throughout the book, because August grows up to be an anthropologist, I have her remarking on the way culture, other cultures deal with it in response, in relation to what she's experiencing or remembering in a certain moment. At one point, there's a woman, Jenny, who has two children. And, um, and you kind of have the sense that the kids are not gonna make it. And then she talks about how this, this one culture in a country in Africa where a grave is dug when a baby is born and how that, um, for me, that there was all of this discovery. There's this saying that sometimes the story knows more than you do about what it's trying to say. And I found that again and again, that I had these big plans for the narrative, and the narrative had other plans. <laughs> so I think um, I should take questions. Um, does anyone have questions for me? And again, you could ask me about anything, including those books y'all are holding. <laughs> <laughs> And if you could tell me your name when you come up. Hi. Good afternoon, I'm Catherine Long, and thank you. I've enjoyed your words tremendously. And I'd like to ask you a question that takes you in another direction. I work in an elementary school where I strive to have the book collection mirror my students. Mm -hmm. And the publishing world makes that extremely difficult to do. Obviously, people have recognized your talent. Mm -hmm. You know, I've tried things like when the scholastic salesperson no. comes, and I'll say, I'll listen to your sales pitch if you listen to me talk about why your collection needs to be mm -hmm. changed. Mm -hmm. And I was astounded not only by um, the lack of ignorance of why it's important, uh -huh. but also her definition of what was good children's literature for children of color. So what was her definition? Do you remember? Um, well, it's not so much she had a specific definition, but the books she pulled out of her bag. Mm -hmm. Like um, one of them was about a Latino immigrant worker who basically became anglicized and won a beauty contest. <laughs> and you know, uh, when Scholastic came to my school, I made them take that and several other books off the shelves. Okay. Um, so it's you know, do you have any suggestions? What's helped you along? Can schools? Can we do anything? Uh huh. To so so um, tell me your first name again. It's Catherine. Catherine is talking is talking about the mirroring books mir mirroring the experiences and the lives of the young people in her classroom. And there's an amazing academic, Dr. Rudine Sims Bishop, who did a lot of work on literature and African-American children, um, and was kind of at the forefront of multicultural children's literature. And she, one thing she talks about is the, experience, is the importance of kids having both mirrors and windows in their classroom, mm -hmm. that they have books that mirror their experience, and that they also have windows into 
uh, other, other experiences they might not otherwise ever have and sliding glass doors so they can walk into those experiences. Um, and, and for so many of us who are people of color, who are queer, transgender, whatever it is, we grow up with a lot of windows into other worlds, but not mirrors. And, and one of the things that organizations like We Need Diverse Books mm -hmm. and Marley Diaz with her 1,000 Black Girl Books um, have done is try to get publishers to be more mindful that the world does not just look a certain way, that families don't just look a certain way, that um, young people don't just look a certain way, and get those books into the classroom. I think there needs to be more push against organizations who are not doing that work. Um, I think it's very hard for us to uh, change the clubs that come into the into the school because it's work and and um, and you know one thing about certain book clubs is that they they sell books very cheaply. Uh, but the sad thing about those is those books don't last. I whenever I sign one of those book club books, I have to get out a ballpoint pen because a felt tip pen is going to go right through mm -hmm. the paper and you know the binding will. Um, eventually give way and the kid has to buy the book again in you know a year or six months or whatever but I think it's really important to look those sites are, have are very um, we need diverse is um, really interactive and and people are coming from everywhere to talk about the books that are out there American Indians and children's literature is a is a great um, place to look also um, Reading While White. There are all these great blogs that are really having this conversation and talking about the books that can get in, that work in the classroom. So you do have a bigger library. I, I think there was a time when we only had like Scholastic, right? It's like, oh, this is representational, so we have to choose from this pot. And, and that's not the case anymore. And even places like First Book, which is doing really good work to get books into the classrooms at discount prices is another way. But I think um, the way to create change is, you know, to step away and say, I'm not participating in this. And I think until lots and lots of people do that, those organizations are going to still come into the classroom with those books that I think are poisonous for our young people. I think um, when you see yourself in literature, you see yourself in the world. And there's a legitimacy that comes with that. And if kids don't I mean, how do they know that they can grow up to be writers or doctors or lawyers or teachers um, if they don't have those mirrors? So thank you. Thank you. Y'all are so quiet. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Meg. My daughter is 14. She's the reason I found your work because someone gifted her Brown Girl Dreaming. Um, and I loved it and Thanks. bought another one, bought uh, Growing in Brooklyn. Uh, she didn't want to come tonight because she's 14. And I said, you know, you can come, but you don't. Have Good. I'm not going. Yeah. Said, okay. yeah. <laughs> um, but the root of my question, she's been a reader forever mm -hmm. and, um, and seems to enjoy writing and writes some good things, I think. Do you have... Um, and it's, I don't need her to be a, a world famous writer, mm -hmm. but do you have suggestions for keeping her interested in that or encouraging it? Yeah, I think the way we get to writing is by reading. Um, and so it seems like she's on the right track. I've met so many young people who are avid readers and, and are writing as a result of it because you learn to write from reading. And if she's, if she's, interested in writing fiction, she should be reading fiction. If she's interested in fantasy, she should be reading fantasy, poetry, whatever it is. And she should copy writers. I mean, as a young writer, I have a copy of the uh, American Negro po Poetry Anthology that I um, got from the library when I was a kid and still have. Um, and and all, it, there's all of this writing in there by uh, where I'm copying Langston. Langston Hughes wrote a poem, mm -hmm. and then right next to it, you see my copying it and changing a couple of words. But I was studying the writers. You know, I was writing. I was trying to figure out how they did it, how they got me to feel a certain way. So it's not just about reading, but of course it's about reading it as an engaged reader, going back and reading the same books again and again. Um, and I think the uh, thing you, the best thing you could give a writer, a young writer, is a library card and 
let them, if you have the financial access, let them buy as many books as they want um, or, or uh, chair uh, the NBA and then just get them for free. So, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, I think just the writing. And I think it is important to listen to writers talk about their work. So, I mean, fortunately, she could watch me on YouTube now. Mm -hmm. um, but, but seeing where there's this um, common thread, right, in the way I write and the way she writes, I think that also helps them um, feel legitimized in how they're getting their story on the page. But first and foremost, um, do it with joy. As a young person, the reason I wrote is because I loved writing mm -hmm. and, and people allowed me to do it because they knew I loved doing it and there was no pressure to do anything beyond write my stories. And I always said, I want to be a writer. I want to be, a, you know, from the time I was seven years old, mm -hmm. which you find out in Brown Girl Dreaming. But, um, but there was no access to like publishing or anything, which was great. You know, I, I, I wasn't, I didn't need that. I just needed to be able to have permission to write stories and to learn how to write stories better and better until I went to college and majored in English and minored in British literature that I started saying, okay, now I want to put stories in magazines, you know. Um, actually, in high school, the high school, my literary journal, in um, lower school, my literary journal. But for the most part, it was the joy of writing. Thank you. Thanks, Meg. Hi. Hey. <laughs> uh, my name is Maya. Um, I haven't finished your book, but I am enjoying it thoroughly. Um, my favorite part is the well, you've developed the relationships between August and the women and her father, but primarily the relationship between her and her brother. Mm. Could you speak a little bit about your inspiration for that? Oh, so my inspiration for uh, August's brother, who I adore. I mean, he just, when, when we first meet him, he's an adult. And then we go back and we see him as this little boy. Um, I think part of it was just wanting to, someone had asked me, why the moms, you know, in the book are, there, there's a lot of struggle with the moms, like an, what's happening with Angela's mom, Gigi's mom, August's mom, and then the dads are, uh, you know, these kind of stand-up guys, like, and, and for me, that part of that was, you don't see that in a narrative a lot. There's the myth of the black man leaving the family, and that's what um, we hear a lot, and I, di I didn't, I feel like as a writer, uh, I have a responsibility to my narrative, and I also have a responsibility to my community. Um, so um, with the brother, I think I, I wanted to show this really deep relationship between a sister and a brother, and, and, how, and the ways that it switches off. So she takes care of him, and then he's taking care of her, and she's teasing him because he's, um, He's a Muslim and she's no longer practicing, so she's eating pork and everything. And that kind of teasing si sibling relationship that can happen and still happens no matter how devastating the circumstances. And, and, um, and when, when he cuts his arm and goes to Kings County in that moment of am I going to lose him too is kind of one of many wake up moments for August. But I, I just really wanted to put a sweet sibling relationship on the page. Thank you. Thanks, Maya. Hey, Hi. I'm you? Jen. Thank you so much hey, for your Jen. work. Thank you. Um, when you were reading from um, the novel, I was thinking about books like Louise Merriweather's uh, Daddy Was the Numbers mm -hmm. Runner and Kristen Hunter's um, so brother, uh, what is it? So brothers and sister, sister Lou, Lou uh -huh. right? Yeah. yeah. So, did you go into that um, that sort of treasure trove of uh, <laughs> black the the black kind of coming of age novels in the city when you were doing your research? So, so um, Daddy was a numbers runner. Um, the Friends by Rosa Gee mm -hmm. and that trilogy. Um, a Tree Grows in Brooklyn, um, and um, of course the title is taken from James Baldwin's Another Country, mm -hmm. uh, and so, and Colm Toybin's Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. um, so, so it was definitely a lot of inspiration bringing the book together, but Daddy Was a Numbers Runner was, and, and Tree Grows in Brooklyn, which is for me the white version of mm -hmm. Daddy Was a Numbers <laughs> Runner, um, because they're both at the, in the same time and both right. coming of age in right. very different environments. Um, were were 
huge were bibles for me as a kid yeah. so so they definitely and also Carson McCullers member of a wedding mm -hmm. um so they d definitely have an impact on me both the southern writers and the city writers the mm -hmm. New York writers oh cool thank you thanks yay hi my name is Kayla, hey, Kayla and I wanted to know how did you know you wanted to be a writer uh, so that's a great question. I, well, when I was a kid, I got in trouble for lying a lot. <laughs> and, <laughs> and I had a teacher who said, instead of writing, and obviously I wasn't good, right? Because I got in trouble for it. Like if I was a really good liar, no one would know. But, um, but I had a teacher who said, instead of lying, write it down. Because if you write it down, it's fiction. Yeah. And, and I was like, wow, I could do this legitimately? <laughs> uh, but I was always like telling stories, telling stories. And every time I read a book, I remember the first time my third grade teacher read, and I talk about it as, you know, in Brown Girl Dreaming, The Selfish Giant to me by Oscar Wilde. Um, and then later on when she read, um, um, oh my goodness, the one by Hans Christian Andersen about the, the Little Match Girl. Uh, and both of those books, when I f finished, when she finished reading them, I was of course in tears. But the, I said to myself, I want to do this. I love the way these this makes me feel. And and the books were teaching me empathy, right? They were teaching me how to care for someone outside of my own head. But they were also, and they were teaching me to love and. They were teaching me how to build character and all of this stuff. And I was just like, I want to do that. I want to do that. And I didn't have other writers in my family. It wasn't a neighborhood where writers came. It wasn't like now where you could go to a bookstore or a library or your, class or your school and meet a writer. So I didn't know even how writers did it. But I was just always saying I want to be a writer. All right. Thanks, Kayla. I have a weird question. I'm a huge fan of your writings, and I'm a teacher, so the kids have read those two. And then I'm a big fan of Jason Reynolds. Oh, Jason, my boy. <laughs> right? Oh. Yes. Jason, Jason Reynolds. Reynolds. I mean, every book he's ever read, I want to just eat it. I, yeah. just, I just love it. I want y'all to do something together. Uh, we, we're trying. He was just at my house. We do a lot of stuff together, but it's usually at my house. <laughs> no, really. I just can I see. I wish he was here because he lives in Maryland. Does he live in Maryland? Yeah, he came. He moved back you from Brooklyn. You shouldn't have told me you're not going to be stalking. Yeah, right? you're going to stalk him. <laughs> But I'm He's just saying, phenomenal. Not, if you all haven't read Jason Reynolds' work, Ghost, As Brave As You, All American Boys that he did with Brendan Kiley. Uh, and the new one is coming out. The second book of Ghost is coming Patina. out. Patina. Patina. I can't I'm like, wait. It's not out yet. I've it's, been dying to read it yeah. to August. But the thing is that, you know, the way that you all write about black people um, is not what we see a lot. And the way that Jason Reynolds and you, the way he write about black men and boys is the most loving yeah. thing ever. And then you with the women part, I just can see that combination oh. just. I'll, I'll, I, oh, I left my phone in there. And I, I was gonna, try, I, I was try. about to FaceTime. I'm like, Jason, we I want to. And Jason knows me. I see him all the time. I'm a uh, stalker. Oh, okay. so, I want, I, so if you all could just. I mean, even travel together. I uh -huh. think it would be great for children. Oh, he can travel. He <laughs> is on the road a lot. Yeah. I'm he doesn't have because, children. Because he was talking about, you were, when you were naming the books that, that really inspired you, and when I heard him talk about it, and then it changed the way I teach in terms of, you know, we're trying to tell children what's important to read, mm -hmm. right? Why can't we allow children to select their own literary canon? Mm -hmm. You know, James Baldwin would mm -hmm. be in mind, and... Alice Walker, and when I was in school, that wasn't respected. So mm -hmm. why can't we all broaden ourselves to let children decide, yeah. read enough to decide what is in their literary canon, and that not means. subscribe to what Ooh. the dead white men that, we, uh -huh. that 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 are not our. That's so, not in my canon. Uh -huh. that make sense? Uh -huh. No, it makes yeah. total so sense. That's and, a brilliant you idea. And Jason have, you all have given me a new canon. Oh you know, man! Thank, Thank you. For that. you. Yeah. <laughs> I love the what's my can and we need to hashtag that. So. <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> oh, that's fabulous. And Rita Williams Garcia. I got to throw her in there. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hi, my name's Marlene Hoffman, and I loved that book. And now I see the ones for younger, and I'm going to get them. But my question is, what's coming? 
<laughs> That's a great question, Marlene. Uh, what's coming is a National Book Award winner. That's not going to be me, but I'm going to help choose. <laughs> and then as soon as I finish reading all those books, hopefully I'll be able to write again. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm actually working on, I just got, I was in France for a month and I was actually in Saint Paul de Vence um, where James Baldwin spent a lot of time um, and I was researching black expats in France uh, um, and I want, I'm trying to figure out the uh, nonfiction element of it. I was also in um, Israel Palestine earlier in the year and I wrote a piece for in the Kingdom of Olive and Ash which I don't know if you have. Um, um, juxtaposing what's happening in Palestine and the Black Lives Matter movement. So, so I'm thinking a lot about nonfiction and, and, and what I'm going to write that's nonfiction and I'm also working on a middle grade novel. So, yeah, yeah I'm back. <laughs> Thank you. So is that it with my shy people? I have a question. Uh -huh. I'm curious how you um, juggle <laughs> being a mom mm -hmm. and being a author. Oh man, it's um, it's it's hard. Last night I was I felt so guilty. I was at um, a Poetry Society of America event, um, and I had the whole family there because they were giving me an award. And we were it was at the New York Botanic Gardens, and we were there till like eleven. And this morning, my third grader was like, "I'm so tired. You always have to take us somewhere." And, <laughs> And, and I was just like, oh, I'm so guilty. Um, I, I, uh, my partner, my partner's a physician, and, and we, we, we make it work, and we couldn't make it work without the village. Um, so I think today Toshi is getting our daughter, little Toshi. Um, she's the, our, our kid's god mom. And, and Jackson Leroy has, um, he had piano, and he had um, baseball practice, and his sitter is getting him to that. Um, but I know, I can tell you every day, the calendar is in stone. I mean, you know, we have a lot, we have to be very organized. And I write, um, the family is, everyone's out of my house by 7.30. Um, so from 7.30 to like three, I can write or clean, which I do when I'm procrastinating. <laughs> so, so that's how I juggle it. Okay, I'm the only one that's sweltering. Okay, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, I'm Sydney. Um, my introduction to your books was through If You Come Softly and uh -huh. the sequel, which I read over and over, and um, which obviously have been relevant for 200 years, but also especially in recent years feel really relevant. And every time I see the mothers of the movement at rallies or protests, mm. I think about Maya's mom, especially from the sequel, and I wonder if you think about going back to her and how she would engage with that oh. or think about them? Oh, that's such a great question. Uh, so for those of you who hadn't read um, If You Come Softly and Behind You, um, it, and if you come, if you come softly, is a retelling of Romeo and Juliet, and it's about an interracial relationship. Um, uh, Kayla has it. Uh, uh, <laughs> black guy falls in love with a white Jewish girl who's secular, and they meet at an Upper East Side uh, private school, and, um, and he gets killed in a case of mistaken identity by cops. Um, when I wrote the book in 1998, the criticism I got was this would never happen. And, and so, and which is so interesting, because now what people would say is I'm um, headline chasing, right? But when I think of his mom, who it, she's a novelist and his dad's a filmmaker, he comes from this pretty wealthy family. Um, you know, it was no mothers of the movement or anything like that. It was just you live in your own grief. Um, but but I, do, I think about her. I think about Ellie. Uh, I think about um, Jeremiah's dad. But it would be hard to go back to it in this time because, because it, I, I'm sure it would be considered cliche almost. And, and that said, when you look at someone like Angie Thomas, The Hate You Give, which is a brilliant book, um, I think there are a lot of young writers who can, you know, here yeah, I'm passing the torch to you, tell the story from an angle that's going to be so much more relevant now. Thank you. Thanks, Cindy. Hi. 
Hi, it is always a pleasure to hear you speak and you've been in this business a really long time and you've navigated it with such grace and poise. Mm. And I'm just curious, what might you have told your debut self? to kind of get prepared on this journey for us that are just starting. Oh, out. wow. What would I have told my debut self? Um, uh, to go slow. You know, I think, um, and Jason talks about this too. You know, Jason has been writing for a long, long time. And, and to look at us now, you kind of think we're, I think there are people who think we kind of came out of nowhere as overnight successes, but it wasn't until probably around my 20th book um, that people started paying attention to Jacqueline Woodson. And I think when I first started, I thought when I wrote Last Summer with Mason, I'm like, oh, I'm going to blow up. I'm going to be everywhere and everyone's going to know my name. And people were like, who are you? <laughs> uh, and, and, and so I think it, the, it's like pregnancy. It teaches you patience and it teaches you um, that you're in this for more than just yourself, right? It's as it um, Lin Manuel Miranda says, it's not a mo moment; it's a movement, and 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 it's really important to know how important the work you're doing is, because I think that's going to keep you doing it during the really frustrating times, during the times where um people seem to be blowing up and getting published all around you and you're just kind of sitting in one place or haven't finished your book yet <laughs> um but i think uh i came to this in the 90s and i, feel, I always talk about how the bodega doors open and you know me and rita and like all of these people came in and i think now that as things shift there's, there's a lot more space for so many more of us to tell our stories, and, and we are working to keep that space open, to keep those doors open so that younger writers can come through telling their stories. Um, and by younger, I don't always mean age, I just mean new stories in the world. Um, and, and so I, I, I think I would have told my younger self that there is, don't worry, people have you, you know, people have got, and I feel like so many people from Virginia Hamilton to Rudine, um, to Walter Dean Myers, um, and to Arnold Adolph, like, there were all these writers who were like, we got you, you know, we'll get you through this, the good and bad and the ugly. And, and that was very, very helpful. But I, but definitely patience, patience from everything from writing the story to helping people figure out how to get your stories into the world. Thank you. Thank you. Probably have time for one or two more questions. Any final takers? No Cat. coming up and asking me while I'm signing. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> one more? I'll repeat it. Uh, well, we know what happened to Angela. We know what happened to Gigi. We know what happened to August. Um, what more do you want to know about her? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's so funny. Uh -huh. And Sylvia, I, you know, I, I wanted to keep Sylvia kind of unknown because that's how August left her. Um, and in order to, for August to know her life, she could have heard it through the brother and all of them. But, um, but, but I wanted her to have that moment on the, pa on the train, reading the paper, you know, looking like a professional um, to show that, yeah, she's okay. Like, I, I think I, I'm more, um, I, I wonder what happened to the baby. Like, that's the one that stays with me. Um, who, who does she become given this history, given her backstory? Thank you. Thanks, everyone. All right, round of applause. <laughs>